Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll talk about the issue of food waste and food security in America with special guests. Stephen Shelley, President and CEO of Farm Share Incorporated in Florida, and Rick Namias, Founder and CEO of Food Forward in Los Angeles, California. So thank you so much for coming. It's, it's great to have the great state of, of Florida and the great state of California represented here on the show. Uh, but one of the things that, that we are going to talk about are the problems that we all have in common. So up to 40% of food that is produced in the U.S. goes to waste, while so many families go daily without food. So let's dive into a discussion of food waste and preventing food waste and how do we make sure that Americans are fed? And, and uh, let's start with you, Stephen, if you, if, if you don't mind. Um, you know, I, I looked up Florida's agricultural sector. Um, it basically ranks 18th in the nation. California ranks number one. We really have no excuse for hunger in this country. Um, how do you see this, this issue unfolding in your neck of the woods? Yeah, so you're right. So Florida is a huge producer, especially in the winter. We're kind of considered the uh, America's breadbasket. We have a lot of specialty crop producers, corn, squash, zucchini, beans, you know, all those things that people love on their tables during Thanksgiving and New Year's. Um, and it's a shame that, you know, 40% of that food is going to waste. And so farm share, you know, 1991, we were formed about 30 years ago. And this, this unique concept that this food was going to waste, how could we capture that, ultimately grab it and use it to feed people for free and free of charge. And that was what the foundation of Farm Share was uh, when this was created by our founders some 30 years ago. And we've since then developed great relationships with our local farmers. We've been able to capture those foods, those foods that are currently being underutilized and use that to feed the entire state of Florida. Last year, it was almost 51 million pounds of just fresh fruits and vegetables alone that we were able to save and keep from being wasted. You know, it's, it's interesting because there's also uh, a, an element that previously um, was preponderant, this, this idea that somehow that if uh, food is given away instead of thrown away, that somehow you would erode the whole supply chain, you would erode the price that farmers received, you would erode the price that retailers received and so on. But Rick, it looks to me like the problem of hunger is so uh, endemic here in the United States, that none of that is true, right? I mean, you can basically figure out a way to have the supply chain, the commercial side thrive, but in a complementary way to the philanthropic side, right? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, just going back to what you were talking about at the top of the show, um, COVID has laid bare certain inequities uh, that were just bubbling under the surface that we cannot deny anymore as far as who gets to eat, who gets to eat healthy food, who has um, parity with health and who has access to uh, medicines and, and um, hospitals and such. Food to me is medicine, food is life. And it's one of those things where when you look at the economics from almost any um, angle, just let's say the overproduction of fresh produce that is uh, been part of the industry because of need, because of the land we have, because of the um, cost benefit in it you see that uh, 40 to 50% of what is grown is basically grown as uh, an insurance policy. And at the end of a year, uh, when you don't have a hurricane or you don't have uh, some kind of catastrophe, uh, you have a massive amount of uh, surplus. And I think that what we need and what we're, I think starting to see Knockwood with this new administration is a new step into what can we do as a nation to look at what we're creating and share this abundance in places of scarcity. The thing that I think is also really interesting is that if you look at the, if you look at growing to surplus that is then discarded, look at the supply chain costs of that, right? If you have 40% of the product that is basically being discarded, basically it's for, you're discarding 40% of the fertilizer, you're discarding 40% of the seed, you're discarding the 40% of the land that is under cultivation. You're discarding 40% of the roads that are being used in order to transport those goods. In a sense, we are, are paying for a huge amount of stuff that we just then throw into the garbage, while on the other hand, we have people who are going hungry. How do we, well, let, let, instead of going to, to the top line, to, to this sort of overarching picture, uh, Stephen, talk about 
how you're organized, the logistics of what you're doing, how you collect um, food and how you distribute it. Sure. So that's uh, that's one of the key things. You know, the idea, the concept of trying to capture this food is, is an easy one. You know, it, it's, it's innovative, but it sounds simple. But in reality, it's very, very complex because you can try to capture all the food you want. But it's a perishable food product. And by the time it gets to you, a lot of times the way the farmers are making donations, because first they're trying to move this product on the open market. If right. the price doesn't support that, now they're reaching out to food banks like us to say, can you take it so that I don't have to dump it? By that point in time, you're 10 days, 12 days into, into the cycle of that. So you've got to get that food. You've got to get it into your warehouse. And then you got to turn it around within 24 to 48 hours and get it into an agency or a recipient's hands to make sure they can then eat it and consume it so that it's got it, it's put to good use. That's and you're making a great, a great, great point, right? Even before you get it into your warehouse, you've got to pre-plan and the farmer has to pre-plan because they know, they know when they put that seed in the ground that a certain amount of that product is likely to not end up going to commerce to commerce. So you have to have a very sophisticated front end planning system in addition to that very sophisticated logistics system, don't you? You do, yeah. You have to develop that relationship, you know, because ultimately the farmer wants to sell every every piece of produce that he grows or she grows. Uh, and so they're never really looking to donate, although I think they should. That's part of this conversation is I think that the farmer should build in some of that access, knowing that they're likely going to have to make this donation. And they do have relationships with food banks like us. They make a phone call right away. We have a fleet of trucks that we send to them. We pick up that food and we bring it back to our warehouse to then push it through our supply chain as a food bank. Um, but it does take planning. Otherwise, it, it doesn't work. And Rick, could you uh, describe a little bit about how your organization functions? Because you also have this whole gleaning operation, which I thought yeah, we, was we really started, fascinating. We started, uh, you know, as, as just about the largest urban gleaning organization in the country, Food Forward started in a backyard, just about a quarter mile from where I am now. It was an idea of seeing food lines at pantries during the recession in 09, um, just mushroom and seeing all this fruit from people's home fruit trees going to waste and connecting the two and being a bridge with volunteers. And so we started with backyards and uh, urban orchards. <clears throat> we added farmers markets. And then the big one was the wholesale market, which is the largest by volume in the United States here in Los Angeles. And it's a very simple thing. It's about taking stuff that is surplus and getting it to, to places of need. We've been very, very clear from the beginning that we act as that bridge. We do a little bit of public outreach, but most of it is a B2B operation. But as Stephen said, it is a really intense um, logistics operation because before we even touch the food, it's on its way to decay. And we're dealing with a very perishable product, which you know, um, even our, uh, our wholesale drivers are not just drivers. They're actually skilled procurement uh, experts who actually go in and inspect the produce to make sure it's not at a certain point of decay that by the time it actually gets through our system, it's of no use to anybody. And so um, sticking with you know, the, the produce, we don't deal with self-stable products of any kind because of what we feel is um, a big gap in need around uh, you know, food security, which is fresh fruits and vegetables and plant-based diets. Um, it has added definitely um, dollars and, uh, you know, sweat and blood to, to our operations. But at the end of the day, when you, you get that chain moving and you really come to understand what's at, at stake, but also the relationships that you can build with the farmers, with the wholesalers, it's a pretty amazing thing. And if you flash back a year when the food system was really buckling across the country, and organizations like ours and Stevens were available to actually step in so that less and less of that produce was thrown out. It actually was an odd silver lining because it created opportunities, which now we can actually expand on as far as partnerships with growers, packers, shippers, all across the region. I, I also think it's really interesting, uh, your point about squeezing time out of the process because you don't really have any time if you're dealing with fresh and and uh steven are you also primarily focused on fresh as, a, as opposed to uh shelf stable products uh the packaged goods that that really don't uh deteriorate that that often uh farm share does both so we were founded on the the fresh fruits and vegetables and and that was the primarily what we did for probably the first 10 15 years or so of our existence but over the last 10 or 12 years we've expanded so last year we did 135 million pounds of food 
of that, like I said, 50 million was fresh fruits and vegetables. So you have a substantial amount of our food products that is also shelf stable proteins, uh, canned goods, milk, dairy, things of that nature so that people can have a full well, well-rounded meal. But our, our specialty still, what we do best is fresh fruits and vegetables. Now we talked about uh, putting together staff. You've got, you've got people who are doing uh, modeling and planning, financial planning and, and so on and so forth. You have uh, people who um, are basically procurers that would be called buyers under another uh, circumstance, but they're, they're procuring and they're also um, ensuring that if you are committing those 30 trucks uh, or, or your entire logistics chain, that you actually have enough time to get that product to market and it's going to be in good enough condition, right? Then you have a group of people who, when they accept the, 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 uh, the fresh products in particular, that they're, um, th- they're reviewing those products because not all those, those products are going to arrive in sufficient conditions, right? Then you, you have the logistics operation, the truck drivers and all that. You have systems. I mean, this is a very, very sophisticated operation. Um, in terms of, of staff stability, um, retention, the mix between permanent staff and volunteers, uh, how do you manage that, Stephen? You know, it's tough as a not-for-profit. You know, our, our funding is volatile, and so it goes up and down from year to year. And so you try to maintain at least a basic level of service that allows you to maintain and distribute as much food as possible year in, year out. Volunteers is a great way to supplement your staffing. It allows you to bring in people who uh, you don't have to pay, you don't have health benefits for, you don't, you know, but, but are willing to give it to their time and help you move that food product. And so they become a big part of the overall plan. But ultimately, you usually have to rely on your, your staff. That's the way you're going to get most of your product moved and acquired and done right. Um, and the key is to find those that are mission oriented. At least that's what we found. You know, you want staff members that love what they're doing, that they're there for the mission, not for the money. And, and ultimately, they put in long, hard hours, but they smile at the end because they've made a difference in the world. They've made a difference for their fellow man or woman. Uh, and we found that's been a very successful model uh, in helping us be successful as an organization. And Rick, how, how do you build your team? And, and, and also, every time you have a volunteer, you have to have somebody who trains the volunteer, who manages the volunteer, right? Yeah, we started. I mean, I was the very first volunteer as the founder and CEO. Um, I was the first person picking tangerines back in uh, 09. But we've now, on a good year, moved to using between four and 5,000 unique volunteers doing our work. Uh, now, granted, most of those are in the backyard um, fruit tree gleaning program, as well as the um, farmer's market recovery. Those are all volunteer led programs. But we've also had volunteers that migrate into staff. And I think there is something that we also look at as our board of directors are the super volunteers. You know, those are people that give dozens and dozens of hours a month to keep the organization running, to help with fundraising and governance and that sort. But our staff is unique. Uh, we've had mostly folks coming in from outside food recovery uh, because it is a relatively new field. I was a, you know, I was a photographer. I had no background in nonprofit before I started this. And my C, my COO came from uh, charter schools. My CDO came out of um, advocacy and, and stuff happening in Washington. But what we've learned is food is a wonderful foundation. It's something that uh, those of us who are privileged enough get to uh, embark on three times a day. It's a great way to build community. And so we have found that, you know, it's really about creativity, stamina, intrepidness, and innovation coming into the organization. And we embrace individuals in various roles from junior all the way up to senior leadership. Um, As long as they come in with, I think, that love of the mission and understanding that both, um, you know, food security and food waste is what we're about. Well, uh, Dr. Samuel Carter actually um, mentioned in, in a comment, he said outreach is key and finding the right gatekeepers and stakeholders is really important. And what you're saying is really food binds us all together, right? If, if, if you're a Democrat, you eat food. If you're a Republican, you eat food. If you're an independent, you eat food. It doesn't matter who you are, what your beliefs are, right? You can always identify with the fact that hunger and your, and your child's hunger is, is something that needs to be addressed right away. And, and it doesn't matter if you're a photographer or if you're an advocate or if you're a business person, uh, you've got to eat, right? Absolutely. I would also say that I, I, I've come to look at hunger as not a supply problem, but a distribution problem. Mm-hmm. And I think we have, you know, in the last decades of creating 
your Amazons and your FedExes and your, your you know, mega UPSs, that we have the means and the technology to solve these issues if we have the empathy and the will to do it. There's so also a, a perception uh, issue. We just uh, finished a poll in which uh, we asked, do you stay away from buying uh, bruised fruit and veggies at the grocery store? And 74% of people said, yes, they stay away from that. So that right there is a source of waste, right? In the commercial sense, uh, the farmer who is trying to sell their product at the highest possible commercial price is going to know that downstream that whoever the buyer is, is also going to be discarding uh, some things, let alone the fact that not all the, pro the uh, farmer's product is going to be purchased at the point of sale. So there is, a, there is a definite supply, and that goes to your point, uh, Rick, that this is a distribution problem, that supply is there, it's, it's connecting the dots between people in need and people who have, right? Correct. It, it really is definitely uh, finding that. We work with over 350 unique agencies across eight counties, seven states, and even tribal regions. Um, and it's about finding partnerships where we can bring to the table, you know, the produce and they can get it that last mile. And I think it is understanding, again, the passing of the ton in a really professional time sensitive way and so much as possible once you find those partnerships instead of trying to do all that work yourself. Uh, Rick, do you also uh, help uh, urban gardeners since you're a gleaning operation? Do you help uh, urban gardeners and, and uh, urban growers? Uh, well, we, to... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, when we started, the, the call out was to urban gardeners that had an abundance. You know, we, we find that most fruit tree owners uh, and again, I'm sure Stephen sees this in Florida too, with very optimistic orange trees, they maybe use 10% for their, their own personal needs. That means 90% hangs on that tree for birds, squirrels, rodents, whatever. Um, it's ridiculous. You know, as you said, there's all these, these things that are wasted in the, in the supply chain to get there. Um, we have started finding ways to actually embrace the home gardener even more and started this program called Fruit Share which runs twice a year in the winter during citrus season and in the summer during vegetable and tomato season, where basically it becomes this giant um, free bazaar where people put themselves on a giant map. They either come to take produce or leave produce um, or, or anything in between. And it's a great community builder. And it really, you find all these home gardeners are you know, really beaming with um, being able to share what they've grown. And I think in this last year, as we've all seen, home gardening has really taken off while we've been locked down. And it's gonna be really interesting to see how that continues to grow. There is something so amazing. I mean, I, I will do this after this program. I will go to my front yard, I will pick some strawberries and they'll go in my yogurt today. I mean, that's a, it's, it's a real privilege to be able to do this, but that also brings a great deal of pride when you start growing your own food and understanding you can actually really mitigate a lot of the waste by doing that. I think you also come to appreciate that weirdly shaped strawberry more than you might in the supermarket and pass it up. You may just say, you know what? I'm gonna eat this anyway, because it's, it's about aesthetics. And I think we as a, as a society right now are very overly hung up on aesthetics. We just got a comment as a matter of fact from, uh, from uh, one of our attendees that, who said exactly that, but that uh, he sometimes catches himself in, in, uh, in, uh, in what they, they purchase. Uh, because aesthetics does play a role. But, you know, if you do this a little bit more mindfully, right, Stephen, you, you, kind of, you kind of can catch yourself and you can say, wait a second, you know, I could actually have a different experience if I, if I think about this a little bit differently. And frankly, there are some fruits where that sort of difference in texture from the, natu the natural growth and perhaps a little bit of a, of a bruised kind of thing, a peach, let me tell you, bruised peach is, is some, sometimes the most delicious thing on, the, on this planet, right? Right. And a lot of it's education related, you know, because you talk about the, the buyer drives the market. And so the farmer can't sell the short squash or the bruised squash or the misshapen product because ultimately the grocery store doesn't think the buyer is going to buy it. But through an education campaign, which, you know, these ugly fruit things that you're talking about, that's kind of the, the movement that's going on, um, you know, that starts to change that market. People start to realize and understand that this is perfectly healthy, edible, nutritious, and great tasting uh, fruits and vegetables and produce. 
and they're willing to buy that. And once they're willing to buy that, the grocery stores are willing to stock it, the farmer can sell it, and it starts to reduce the waste overall. And so it really is a, a marketing and education campaign um, that we need to embark on, which I think is happening and has been happening over the last couple of years, and things have been improving, but ultimately, you've got to drive it from the top down. So we just uh, finished a poll where we asked people whether they know what the imperfect produce uh, movement is. And if so, um, have you changed how you buy your produce? And 48% um, said yes, um, but 28% said they've never never heard of the, uh, the imperfect produce uh, movement. So you've heard about it now, right? So we can, we can actually change our habits. I think there's also a higher level issue here about eating with intention you know, knowing where your food comes from, uh, being open to, to different types of foods, but also the quantity in which we consume. You know, um, I've got nothing against Costco, but I think there is this kind of mentality often that you have to buy something in a bigger quantity to make it valuable. And when it comes to fresh produce, we've learned, uh, that means half a box of strawberries can go to waste. I think the Ad Council did a really neat, um, ad campaign a couple of years ago where you watch this strawberry go from seed to field to packing to, to someone's home only to get there, have three or four strawberries eaten and then have the rest of the container thrown out. And I think as we as individuals, people often ask, well, what can I do as a person around this issue? What you can do immediately is the next time you go shopping or go to the farmer's market, think of what you will eat in that next few days or in that week and buy just that. Don't constantly, because it's on sale, buy you know, uh, 18 pounds of grapes or this or that. I think there is a very clear um, way in which people can start to understand <clears throat> using what they need on this planet rather than just going gangbusters because it's cheap. There is a cost to all of it, even the cheap stuff. We don't yeah. have to overbuy. Yeah, I was going to piggyback on that to say the same, that once you get out of the farm fields and you, you get whatever has actually been put into production for consumption, the largest amount of food waste is coming from household food waste. 43% is actually being wasted just for that very reason that Rick mentioned, that you're overbuying, that you're not actually preparing it, that you're not planning ahead. You go to the grocery store, you just buy everything because you're hungry, and then you never prepare any of it, and it goes into the trash, and you end up with 22% of the product going into a landfill. I mean, most of, of the product in a landfill is actually food waste. That's that's fascinating. Most of the, most of the product in a landfill is food waste? The largest yeah, percentage number percent is food waste. Everything else makes up, you know, different varieties. But as far as a bulk amount, it's food waste. Rick, yeah, you, you. One of the uh, highest, I think it's the number three um, issue of, of dealing with climate change is actually food, reducing food waste. That you know, if we can cut down food waste across the planet. Uh, it would make a huge difference in moving the needle. <clears throat> That is, that is just amazing. Um, I, I want to pick up um, on, on a point that you both made, and that is, uh, if you look at this whole chain of value, um, and, and there was some reference previously to what Amazon has done in terms of logistics and, and some of the clarity that came to you uh, through this uh, COVID situation, that we really do have um, a, a, not a uh, supply problem, but a distribution problem. Um, to what extent are you able to leverage uh, technology to create these connections, either through mobile apps, through uh, instant communication that is taking place, even the use of text messaging? Um, you know, I've got I've got something you can pick up today, right? That sort of instantaneous aspect of what we all have with our with our uh, mobile devices uh, today. Um, how, how do you leverage that, or are you able to leverage it? Because you are a modest nonprofit, you don't have a lot of budget to to put into technology like Amazon does, for example. We are scrappy, but we use it all. To be honest, we start text messages, um, but you know, phones, emails. Uh, we use very, very professionalized software that we've taken the plunge and spent the money on because it makes both the procurement and the inventory that much um, easier. You know, we work on the same level that Stevens organization does. We did 62 million pounds of recovery and distribution last year. And for us, we have to do an audit for every pound of food. So it's very worthwhile <clears throat> at the end of the day using professionalized systems to know what's come in and what's gone out. But um, we have built, you know, a whole bunch of different pipelines. But I'll be really honest, Mark, at the end of the day, it's relationships. 
who are you texting on the other end of that phone? Who are you speaking to and who's reaching out to you? And do they feel that you are the right entity to move that food and be able to get at that um, into the hands of folks that need? And, and if you prove, as I think Food Forward has, that you're the right organization to do that in the region you're in, those relationships tend to breed more relationships. And I think in the end of the day, ironically, the farmers are very, uh, they're, they're embracing technology for growing, but when it comes to communication, most farmers we know, um, that's, that's, that's not their strongest suit. And so often it'll take quite a bit of um, communication to get there. But uh, bottom line is you, you use whatever tools you got. Well, it's not transactional is what you're saying, right? I mean, that's, that's the thing about, uh, about uh, in particular, uh, farming as a business. It's not transactional. There's a lot that's not under your control. And relationships and trust and those kinds of person-to-person -person kind of things will never be replaced, ever. Um, but being able to make appropriate use of technology is, is great because it saves time. Uh, Stephen, are you, are you um, recognizing in Rick's description some of how you operate? Yeah, we do. I mean, so as far as the communication, we, we try to use as much technology we can, whether it be through social media platforms, whether it be through text messaging campaigns, whether it be through uh, inventory databases so we can track it coming in and coming out. Um, all of that has been helpful. But at the end of the day, where the backlog usually comes for, for us at Fresh Fruits and Vegetables side is refrigeration and transportation. And so during the COVID, you know, especially right around March, April, we had a lot of our farmers that could no longer move their product to the cruise ships or the restaurants. And so they got backlogged and we did the best we could to capture as much of that we could, as in such short window of time. And ultimately where we found the backlog was we either needed more trucks so that we could move it in and move it out much faster and deliver it, or we needed more refrigeration so that once we got it into our warehouse, we could store it longer in order for it to get it through the, the, the supply chain and supply system. And so those were the two areas where we found we needed the most investment because there's not a lot of refrigerated space um, that's available for this type of use. And with those two things, you can solve a lot of the others. But yes, technology works very well on the, the back end and on the front end, but in the middle is where most of the backlog occurs. We just completed another poll. and We, we talked a little bit about um, selecting food. It's not necessarily buying food, but, but, um, but uh, how, how do people see um, their own uh, decision criteria. And it was, it, it's interesting, 25% uh, each said I select um, fresh and requiring prepar preparation over packaged and convenient. Um, that there was also 25% selecting based on taste, right? But only 4% um, just uh, said that they, they would select package and convenient over fresh. So there's definitely a tilt toward fresh and the other questions are pretty much evenly uh, distributed. Uh, buying locally, uh, buying the food that is least expensive, uh, buying food that looks, looks best. They all received fairly similar numbers. So what we're seeing is a range of human um, responses to food, but taste and fresh seem to be the preponderant uh, trends. So it, it, it seems that some of these messages are getting across. Yeah, and I think one of the other things we find like when we have our food distributions and, and is what to do with the fresh produce, because there's a lot of produce out there that people just don't know how to cook. They don't know how to prepare it. They don't know how to eat it. Uh, they've never had it. We noticed this, especially in Florida, where North Florida is a different demographic than South Florida and what they eat and what they're used to from a fresh fruits and vegetable standpoint is completely different. And if we provide a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables that people in South Florida are used to eating to North Florida, the people in North Florida have no idea what to do with it. And so, so it's cultural, yeah. cultural competencies as well is really important. That's, so the whole idea right. of what you're, what you're supplying, right? Yeah. And, and if, you're, if you're going to teach prep, um, you have to teach prep that is appropriate to the people who are coming to you to help, yeah. right? Absolutely. Right. To help move the product. That's something that came into Food Forward very early um, where uh, we have a very large Hispanic community in Los Angeles. It's, it's a majority of the city actually. And a number of the agencies that we serve uh, predominantly supply produce to Hispanic neighborhoods and communities. And so understanding if we're gonna have this uh, you know, surplus of bok choy and we wanna share it with them, we need to supply recipes that are gonna give these communities an insight into how bok choy might relate to another green that they're used to. Uh, the same thing with black communities as well. 
Um, so making sure that you're distributing produce of a type to individuals that can use it is super important because otherwise it, it just gets wasted on the other end of the uh, supply chain. And that means that your staff have to be sensitive, they have to be knowledgeable, the, the farmers that are connected to you have to be knowledgeable, and you have to be listening to your consumers as well and, and feeding that intelligent back. So there's a whole feedback loop, right? Absolutely. So um, we're coming to the end of our time. So uh, Steve, I'm gonna give you um, a word and then uh, Rick, you're going to, uh, to uh, take us out. If we could change one thing about America's food system and you both have such deep experience but such similar experience, I find this all across the country. It doesn't matter if we're talking about you know, St. Louis, Missouri, or, you know, uh, Seattle, Washington, or Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, everybody is talking in the same language. If you could change one thing, Stephen, what would we change in the United States about our situation regarding uh, the availability of food to everyone? I don't know that there is one thing. I think there's a, a bunch of issues that have, we talked about a lot of them, um, but, but ultimately it is, I think, making the issue important. You've got to make this a priority. And I think that's the number one thing is that this has not necessarily been the top priority that it should have been, uh, both from a farmer's perspective and from a government perspective. And, and hopefully we're changing that and hopefully COVID brought to attention to people that um, it's not one demographic or one type of people that may be hungry at all times, but that hunger can affect anybody. It can affect your neighbor. It can affect your son's teacher. It can affect the, the local you know, football coach. Uh, people, your friends, relatives, and neighbors can be affected by hunger overnight and unexpectedly. And it, this is an important issue that needs to be addressed. Food insecurity needs to be addressed. And I think that's probably the number one thing because where there's a will, there's a way. Awareness, prioritization. Rick, uh, what is your answer to this? Yeah, I, I believe that, you know, we need to look at this not just as, you know, a food bank is a dumping ground for mac and cheese and granola bars, but that we have a, um, a population that is stably food insecure, and there's a whole bunch of underlying issues that tie into that. And while we work on hopefully dismantling some of those issues and addressing them, we need to make sure that people are eating with dignity, that they're eating healthily. And that food, again, acts as medicine. It acts as a conduit to good health and happier lives. And they are not just being given what doesn't sell on the grocery um, shelves. We have this amazingly wealthy country and this amazing abundance of, of produce, which to me is just a metaphor for life. We need to share it. We need to give it. We need to make sure everyone has access to it. Such, such important points. Um, I would urge everybody to go to the internet and call up under images, under Google, call up images of the Great Depression. And then think, you can walk out with your cell phone, with your camera, walk your streets, and you can take those same pictures today, right? That is an amazing fact, right? You can see the same food lines you can see the same people lying on the streets and sleeping uh, because that's the only place they can really find uh, to bed down for the night. So that's something that we can deal with. And that's what you're talking about. You're talking about dealing with food insecurity in a land of abundance, and it's in our power. We just have to act as you are acting. Thank you so much for your service to your communities. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, thank you all attendees for coming and being part of this show. And, um, and we look forward to uh, our, our discussion on, on Thursday. Um, and, and really, please thank your staffs and your boards for us, uh, Stephen and, and Rick. Sure. Thank, thank you very you much for having us. Have a great day. Take right. care. All right.